a lot of times people talk about existentialism as looking for things which they're willing to live for. That's the wrong way to go around doing things. But the right way to do things is to ask yourself the opposite. What things are you willing to die for? When you're thinking about life, right? You go through life, you go through your day, your day-to-day -day existence. What you're willing to live for changes frequently, I would say. When you're thinking about what you're willing to die for, it seems to be something which is more fundamental, even though it seems to be worshipping or at least focusing on the end of existence instead of the beginning of existence, which is life. A lot of our questions, a lot of our existential thoughts are tied to the idea of the finitude, tied to the death. So thinking about what we're willing to die for is almost just as important or if not even more significant and more telling than what we're willing to live for. Hello and welcome yeah. to this video. Today we are starting a series with Lawrence on existentialism. This is an introductory series to what is existentialism, why someone's interested in existentialism, why you should get interested in existentialism, why it's important and more. Lawrence and I are both philosophy and theology students at the University of Oxford and are both really interested in existentialism. So we can't wait to um, start this series with you. So without further ado, let's get started with the biggest question. What is existentialism? I think it's a very difficult topic to define. Mm. In many ways, it sort of escapes definition. Uh, a lot of existential philosophers are concerned even with going beyond ideas of definition. So a rough sketch of what I think of existentialism is a philosophical approach which seeks to focus primarily on the individual subject and their status as something in the world, surrounded by questions of purpose, the meaning of life, and something which goes beyond the idea of what we might traditionally call like metaphysics. So in particular, I'm thinking of like Heidegger, for example, in, in, this, in this situation. Uh, where he thinks that sort of the Cartesian project, uh, the Cartesian way of approaching things is sort of like asking the second question, where the first question means, should be, I mean, I mean what is to be? What is to be in the world? The sign according to him. So, that, I mean, Heidegger obviously is just one example of this, but I think it's just a general, like, not even school of thought, because not many existentialists agree on everything but as general approach, almost like an attitude to philosophy that we take, where our focus is on the individual existing subject. Mm. I think that's a very interesting presentation because, of course, you, you note it very well. There's not a single kind of school of existentialism exactly. out there, for example. You could read Camus and then you read Dostoevsky and then you read Berdyaev and then you throw in Heidegger and then you throw in Hegel or, or, or who, whosoever you throw in and you could you can look at them and you see significantly different styles, different questions are being raised. And it's not, I suppose, if you look at philosophy of religion, where it's only focused on the idea of God, you get to existentialism and there's questions of phenomenology, there's questions mm, of meaning. True. And as you say, there's questions like the one Heidegger raises, which I think is one of the central questions of existentialism, of what does it mean to be in the world? How do we experience the world around us and how do we experience the nature of ourselves being situated in a world which we don't know. And I think one of the key ideas in Heidegger is the idea of truth as aletheia, some uncovering of the unknown that yep. we, and the obscurity which is around us. And I think that's a very good, um, also a very good introduction or a good idea to have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about this existentialism as a topic is, well, what what am I experiencing and how does my experience interact with the unknown and the world around me? So perhaps developing this a bit more, we can go into talking about perhaps why is existentialism very interesting and why is, why is it something which gets covered by a lot of mainstream thinkers of the time and, and main influences of the time? I think one of the major in importances of uh, existentialism is the sort of its rejection of our classical understandings and philosophy. So the, and it's rejection and not like something that it says it shouldn't be accounted for. In fact, it's quite uh, important that these things should be accounted for. But it sort of moves past our uh, discussions around like personal identity, free will, um, epistemology and stuff, and reimagines it 
in a different sense, where instead of us trying to focus on the objects, we are trying to discuss about the subject. And I think it's quite important to analyze that because I think for a lot of people, it is a very much practical way of viewing their life. A lot of people are struck by problems of anxiety, problems of uh, meaning, problems of existence. And in a world where the traditional understandings of traditional answers for those questions, such as religion um, or even uh, their own philosophies, uh, what you might call like something like in the East, like Buddhism and such, these things are starting to be criticized. I think it becomes more important to understand these questions of existence beyond the questions that we have originally and traditionally in philosophy. So as we, as yeah, so something like uh, does free will exist or does, uh, or personal identity, how does something persist over time? These kind of questions are important and they are accounted for by a lot of existential philosophers. But the focus and the attitude to those questions are not always uh, the primary subject here. Rather, it's how, as you said, the experiences, how we deal with the unknown, the infinite, and how we deal with the big questions of, of our lives that a lot of people face. Mm. I think what you touch upon is very interesting because, of course, if you're... I mean, your presentation of existentialism as almost a reimagination and a repurposing of, of core questions in philosophy, I think, is so key. Because if you're thinking about perhaps the history of philosophy and the development of social movements throughout time, you could almost, and I wouldn't say it's a definitive mark of difference, but I think you could put a very big question mark or a very big highlight on the figure of Hegel when you're thinking mm. about views on history, approach to truth approach to the development of society, all of these key questions can be tied back to almost a pre-Hegelian view and a post-Hegelian view, just because of how significant Hegel was in his emphasis on these ideas, movement towards an end of history. What does it mean for spirit to be in the world or spirit as a form of history? Like, what are these things? And I'm, and I'm not trying to perhaps present Hegel or create a massive discussion on Hegel in this video. If you want an illustration of Hegel's thoughts and his phenomenology of spirits, we have made a lecture on that on our channel before, which you can go check out. I'll put a link in the card above. However, what I am trying to present is is that the amount of change that existentialism has on, on humans, on society, is something which is very significant. The amount of themes and ideas that are being wrestled with in, in existentialism, like the idea of, well, of, of, of truth, or what, what does truth even mean, are things which are directly applicable, I would say, to the society we live in today. For example, you're thinking about your social movements, you're thinking about the shifts between the pendulum of the conservative and liberal skill. I'm not trying to get into politics here, but a lot of the moments and motifs that you see in society today can all be tied or at least be understood better via approaching it from an existential perspective. And sometimes I don't like it when I say I'm approaching this from an existential perspective just because it is so broad that when I say I'm approaching it from an existential perspective, I could be talking about some form of psychology, some form of anthropology, some form of history or whatever it is. But at the same time, I think it is a very good point to start off with when you are indeed analysing these questions and these ideas. Do you have anything else to add on that or any thoughts? Of yourself? I think that was all very well said. The only thing I'd like to add to that mm -hmm. is I think when we use the term existential approach, we, yeah, we should be like very specific about what we mean by that. Because like... Heidegger's existential approach is not the same as Sartre's, and Sartre is not the same as Kierkegaard's. And all three of them we put under the category existential, and yet they're all very three different thinkers. Uh, so one of the things I'd say with that is I think every time we use the term existential, we should like qualify it with some other form of analysis that we're approaching here. So like Heidegger might be phenomenological, um, and Kierkegaard might be religious in this example. And... I think even more precisely, when we refer to existentialist thinkers, we should refer to the thinkers themselves rather than the wider existentialist movement and only refer to the wider existentialist movement if they themselves are referring to such a movement. This is why I'm a bit unsure whether we can call Kierkegaard an existentialist himself, but we can talk about that later. Um, but he's definitely referenced within the later literature. 
So, like, I would say an example of this might be in Myth of Sisyphus, when uh, Camus is analyzing the different existential figures throughout the literature. We can then refer to something like a Kierkegaardian explanation or Dostoevsky or, and his own uh, view on things as being particularly existential. But we should be very careful about how we use these lang- this language because we can end up calling a loads of things existential mm-hmm. and it sort of renders the title meaningless at the end of the day if we, if we use it quite uh, thoughtlessly. Definitely. I mean, sometimes when you get these titles, the more the more the more broad they become, the more useless they are, even though sometimes people like to try to make them more inclusive. In fact, the broader they get, the more easy it is for equivocation of people talking past each other, which I think is something very important to note. Perhaps developing on what we've discussed already a bit more is to talk about that question of meaning, because I suppose meaning is something which is at the core of existentialism or at least the core of how we are wrestling with the question of being in the world, how are we meant to view the world around us? What would you say is perhaps the goal of this pursuit of meaning? What is the end goal of it, the telos of pursuing meaning? What would you say are the ideas are surrounding that? I think for me, it is, it is this sort of platonic division between being and becoming. Mm-hmm. So uh, the way that I sort of think about this is that there is a state of being, um, which we are not in at present. And there's a state of becoming which we are in at present. And this becoming lacks some certain factors in one's life. And I think generally, not for all, I don't know if every single existential philosopher makes this sort of move, but I think a few do. I can see this in Kierkegaard, and I can see this in Heidegger, and even perhaps in Dostoevsky too, where there's a sort of state in motion where the characters are playing in and they want to reach into a state of being, a state where they can, say, uh, be comfortable in their existence. Um, one of the interesting things I can, th- I can think about here is Johannes de Silencio's character in Fear and Trembling. He is a person who is in a state of becoming but is trying to analyse and understand what it means to be. And his view is that that answer is a night of faith. But he himself is not there yet, and he makes it very clear that he doesn't know what that means. I think it's a really good example of where Kierkegaard is trying to show uh, this person, the author of the books, in a state of becoming, but he wishes to show you what it means to be in a state of being. Um, even further, like Sickness Unto Death, Anticlimacus, I believe is an author who's meant to be a bit more in a state of being, a bit more in the religious um, sphere. And even then, like, we can see that Kierkegaard is just trying to analyze these different existential modes, as it were. And basically, the overall point I'm trying to make here is that we are analyzing um, these states of becoming, so mm-hmm. aesthetic or inauthenticity or um, bad faith. And we're trying to reach into a state where we can be comfortable in our existential lives and be secure in uh, what it means to be, what it means to exist, what it means to have experiences and into that, the infinite and the finite. Hmm. I think that's a very nice thing you're touching upon, the idea of, of course, the, the idea that we are in a state of becoming or moving towards something, because that, that, propo- that presupposes a form of direction, a form of movement that one has. And I think it's a motif which repeats itself throughout history, in, in especially in ethical uh, philosophy, yeah. at least in the past, where you have the idea of Aristotelian, the progression of virtue from an object to the act, then finally to the habit. It's, it's the mode of moving throughout an internal thought to an external action, the individual parts and procedures of that development, and also what does it mean to reach the end? What is the goal that one is working towards? And that is, I suppose, one form of way of looking at perhaps the precursors of, of this movement that we're talking about when, it, when it, we're talking about this act of becoming. And the same way, the way you represent Kierkegaard, I think is a very important thing to note here. There's, of course, Kierkegaard's famous or um, key idea of him not being a Christian, but becoming one, the act of moving towards something and and the idea of modes. All of these are different perspectives or at least different aspects of reaching towards or at least reaching towards a certain end or reaching towards from one area, an A to a B. And I think that this um, framework or at least this, this landscape or or mental kind of 
idea to have in your brain is something which is very good when you're approaching the idea of existentialism, maybe when you're reading yourself, or maybe you're interacting with some of these quote unquote existential thinkers, you're thinking about your Kierkegaards, your Camus, your, your Dostoevsky, whoever it is, you're thinking about, well, what are these different modes of being that they're discussing or modes of becoming in, in that sense? And, and what are the directions to which they're trying, each of them trying to reach? And in what direction, I suppose, going back to the Heideggerian kind, um, framework is, what directions are they trying to uncover? Where, what fields of uncovering are they trying to do? I think that that's a very beautiful um, dis distinction or idea to have in our brains. Do you have anything to add on to that? I think uh, not much, but one thing I would say is, I, like we can also add in like social factors as well <laughs> here. So I, I'm also thinking about the Beauvoir. So you, you mentioned that uh, one doesn't, is not a Christian, but becomes a Christian. Like her very famous quote, uh, one is not born a woman, but one becomes a woman. Hmm. So where I think the other part that I think we should also analyze here is something that Sartre and de Beauvoir uh, were very interested in is also their social factor in uh, how existentialism works and answers to existentialist questions with um, social systems and uh, structures in mind as well. Hmm. How do you think this social aspect kind of ties in to ties into existentialism. Of course, I suppose it is clearly the case that people who write about existentialism, about meaning and, and or, or phenomenology will naturally interact with the world around them, perhaps, and write about it. But, but how would you say that the interaction occurs in existentialism? Is it more so that society around them dictates their thought or that they're dictating a way in which society can progress? I suppose those are two perspectives to think about. What, which one would you say it is? I think it's even beyond those two ideas. Mm. So there are times when existentialists generally can be quite critical of what they can consider the masses. So like you can think of Kierkegaard's The Crowd is Untruth or, you know, Zarathustra in, for Nietzsche. Like these people are ignored by the people of their time. These people are sort of s distinguishing themselves as someone separate or someone who's able to achieve some sort of existential meaning where others who follow the crowd cannot at least that's how a lot of people in the um in the uh existentialist like youtube's like scene tends to uh, approach things like the idea is that there is sort of like this societal problems that tell you what to do and but you as an individual are separate from that now, I think what is happening at existentialism is a bit more complex than that. I think there's a sense in which this is happening where there is a bit more of a criticism. But I think there is a recognition, especially I think in Sartre and in De Beauvoir in particular, perhaps less so in like, uh, maybe less so in uh, Dostoevsky. Actually, no, I would say Dostoevsky does consider it, but less so definitely like someone like Kierkegaard, uh, where they are considering something considering a individual person's relationship to their social factors as well not just as a form of criticizing the just general idea of the masses but being able to criticize the structures that exist to um which which force these people to live in bad faith or uh forcing them to not be able to fulfill their meaning as well so i think in this sense depending on the existentialist author you're thinking of um you can have both a sort of very critical, distinct view of the individual and the masses, and also have a view where the individual is a member of the masses and there are structures which prevent all of these individuals from achieving these, this kind of meaning. Hmm. I think what you raise is a very interesting idea, and I would like to uh, perhaps um, specify or, or tie into the idea of the individual and the masses, and of course you race, I think it was, the, the group is untruth, or, or that quote in, in Kierkegaard, there's this idea, likewise, in society today, in a broader social aspect, of that combination, that perhaps a, a dichotomy, so I'm not sure whether dichotomy is the right word, between the idea of the individual on one side and the mass as the other side, and you think about what is the correct mode of analysis, and of course, you have perhaps a more right-wing conservative um, the, the, theor, theor, theorists saying that one should approach things purely from the mode of analysis of the individual and those on the other side would say let's approach it from the group from the, the analysis the mode of analysis starts off with the group and hence you have the ideas of critical race theory and whatnot which starts very much from the group and 
as a result, a lot of times in existentialism, you see is that there's this always this constant dichotomy or this dialectic moving between the individual and the group, where, where on one side they're focusing very strongly the importance and need for the, the individual as a mode of analysis to exist. Because at the end of the day, what is being or what is the unveiling of truth? There's no individual to unveil it. But at the same time, there almost is that presupposition or there's that need for the group. Because in some sense, there is that underlying assumption at, at times that we are we are but products of the group in which we stem from, this, the scenarios or society we stem from. And I suppose that dialectic is something which is constantly wrestled with in existentialism and is something that is constantly put against each other. And, and a lot of people are trying to search for the solution of that. Is there anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I think that's the best way to put it, a dialectic. I think a dichotomy makes it too like binary. I think there's a whole degree of these thinkers and these philosophers who are considering these problems um, on whichever whichever uh, extreme you'd like. But yeah, at the end of the day, I think it's, it is more of a dialectic where we are trying to understand the relationship between the individual and the masses or and to use some like Hegelian terms, the universal and the um, individual. And we're almost trying to move away from viewing, it's almost like we can't even escape the dialectic from Hegel, but at the same time, like we're trying to almost use these tools to try and move away from his sort of grand idea of history and, and grand ideas, Geist and spirit guiding all of history in a, in a, in a certain direction and trying to think of it by adding the sort of individual and what um, they decide to do in certain situations that they're faced with in their life. So yeah, that's, all, that's, that's all I'd add to that, but that was very well explained Yes, that's a, that's an interesting point. And I suppose now that we've tied, talked a bit about dialectics, I suppose we've let the cat out of the bag or the cat out of the hat or whatever that phrase is. I suppose one of the things which I would like to um, discuss a bit is the role of dialectics and the role of the dialectical mode of, of thinking in society, especially in, I suppose, in in contrast to, I'm not sure whether you would call it a rationalistic approach of, of a pursuit of truth. And it's very difficult to, I suppose, exactly pinpoint how, how the dialectical interacts with other forms of thinking, but from the fact that on one hand, Nietzsche likes to criticize, of course, the dialectical mode of thinking mm. by saying it's almost, we, we can find no answer to the problem in front of us. Therefore, we've created a dialectic to just throw it and say, well, all right, let's try to synthesize it. But at the same time, you have, and I suppose that would be more of the rationalist approach. Someone might look at it initially and say, well, that's a bit, it's a bit ridiculous. Um, how can you just synthesize everything which you find contradictory? But at the same time, there seems to be some need for dialectics, especially when it comes to thinking about society when it comes to thinking about human existence and human thought just because of how how complex people are and and I suppose the question that we can discuss a bit is perhaps how much of the need for dialectic stems from the the idea of 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 theory and of philosophy and how much does it stem from the recognition that humans are not single-minded and clear human beings are rather a complex web of beliefs, ideas, and interactions. Where do you think the dialectical spirit comes from? I think the dialectical spirit comes from, well, Hegel. He is the guy who, and Hegel, and also I'd say Socrates and Plato. Hmm. So the way that I think about it is, if we look back to the Platonic dialogues, these are dialectical. The sort of modes and processes that Plato wishes to get to his conclusions are fundamentally dialectical. So this is one of the things that uh, we can criticize on as the analytic philosophers, the early analytic philosophers, especially their view on knowledge, right? So their view on Plato's view on knowledge, I mean. So in Theotetus, Plato asks what knowledge is, and he has Socrates discuss this with a young man, Theotetus, but he doesn't come out with a precise answer. He just says what that knowledge can't be. And what analytic philosophers later have done is sort of presume this sort of idea that um, knowledge is justified through belief, right? Mm -hmm. And Plato didn't actually say that. I think the reason why there's this sort of disconnect between their thought and the Platonic dialogue is the analytic philosophers' disregard for dialectic. 
and the, as you said, the more rationalistic view on the world. And this isn't to fully like dismantle or dis or attack analytic philosophy. It's still a very useful tool to uh, have, and especially evaluating arguments for and the stuff that we we will discuss. But the sort of attitude that they have towards dialectic as being something negative. Uh, one thing that comes to me is the is during the Russell Coppleston debate where Coppleston cites Sartre and Russell responds, oh, well, I, I don't intend, I, I've never read Sartre, nor do I intend to read him. Uh, this sort of dismissal of dialectics and of continental philosophy, whatever that means, let's not discuss what continental philosophy is for now, but presuming, um, let's, let's define it as a sort of anything that is not analytic for now. It's not a very good uh, definition, but anything that isn't analytic for now. Uh, his sort of dismissal of these kinds of movements uh, in Europe in particular show the f sort of inability in some philosophers to accept what dialectic is. And this mode ultimately comes down to trying to view wider forces in the world, in the universe, in society as having some sort of role and trying to understand like, what does it mean when we say something is um, bright and something is dark or something is, is red and something is blue? And what does it mean when we have these two opposing ideas next to each other? And how do we wrestle with these two ideas? I don't think it's that much of an extreme claim to try and wrestle with that. But what I find in some philosophers is that they sort of want to throw away all of the, all that kind of thought as sort of nonsense and they just want to analyze the arguments itself. And I think there's disregarding the value of that kind of approach is I think not a very, uh, it's not particularly convincing to me. Hmm. I think that's a good way to put it. And perhaps we can move on a bit to talking about the importance of existentialism. And I suppose hmm. we did talk a bit about it previously, but perhaps we could elaborate it a bit more and talk about what, what makes existentialism important. And I suppose an extension to that, what draws us to existentialism? Because I've met a lot of people who are really interested in analytic philosophy and whatnot. And I would argue that I will probably more, I lean more towards um, continental, but I don't even, and slash existential um, philosophy a bit more so than, than analytical philosophy. Well, perhaps I will, I will ask you the question, well, why is it important to you and why do you, why do you focus on it? Um, the reason why it's important to me is because I've always struggled uh, with the idea of faith quite a lot. So this is the Christian part of me speaking. I've always struggled with what it actually means to exist in a, in a state, in a relationship with God. And I initially got into philosophy because of Aquinas and existence arguments. I really got into a lot of the analytic stuff concerning the modal argument for Plantinger, the Swinburne's uh, like whole argument around the coherence of theism. I was really into that sort of sphere for quite a while. But then sometime I encountered, re I encountered Kierkegaard, I encountered Camus, I encountered um, Sartre. And what these people showed me is that it's really difficult like it's not, it's not, it's not something that you can just uh, argue and then just counter argue about and find counter examples about. It's something which is ultimately a matter of life and death. And what I find particularly interesting in existentialism is its practical applications in the world. Like you can see what it means to live according to the night of faith, or you can see what it means to live according to the night of infinite resignation. You can see what it means to live in a state of bad faith. You can see what it means to live in a state of authenticity. Like all of these ideas like have practical implications for how you live your life. Uh, this is why I think um, existentialism is quite good because it's a very practical philosophy which actually affects a lot of people's lives. And the amount of literature that people have like, written about existential philosophy, existential themes is really interesting to me. And I think more people, I, I, I don't want to make a full-on statement about like how people think, but I think for me, in my experience, when I talk to a lot of people, they seem a lot more interested in these kinds of questions of what it means to live and what it means to exist than 
whether or not this modus tollens or modus ponens argument is actually uh, sound or not. Hmm. I think that's definitely true. I'm yet to ask someone who's ever, I, I'm yet to meet someone who's ever told me that I'm um, trying to solve or um, debunk or respond to Russell's paradox is any more important than trying to um, solve uh, the, the problems of, of life and of meaning and, 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 and what do those things mean. And I, and I share that um, sentiment with you when it comes to existentialism. When, when I think about, well, why am I drawn to it so much is because I think it is the first form of experience it's it's the first form of interacting with these questions of 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 as you put it very rightly life and death you're talking about what it means to be in the world what does it mean to have a relationship with people and have a relationship with with the world around you and that all requires i suppose a very strong foundation in existentialism and at least a penetration into such thought and ideas and and as a result if you're asking the everyday person in the street, I, w- I would agree with you when they're when they're thinking about well, what does philosophy mean to you? The chance of them coming back with some analytic idea of Frege or whoever it is is way lower than them um, analyzing it from like, well, I, I'm I, I'm living in the world today. I do not know what it means to be in the world. I I'm encountered by uh, I have a good friend or a, I had someone who come on my channel recently who who was who did a Kierkegaard interview and he. He was talking heavily about, well, how are we meant to face our finitude? How can we face the fact that we will die? We we are going to be in this world for, what, 80 years, 90 years if you're lucky. And in those 90 years, you have you have a chance while you're at, you're still a child and you have a chance while you're an adult, when you're in old age, you go through different stages of life, different forms of relationships with people will form dependent on your age, your experience, all sorts of things. Well, what does that mean? And how do you how do you live something? How do you live a life which is worthy of that existence? I mean, if you're religious, you would probably think that existence is given by God. And as a result, you should work truly to try to make the most of the, the life that's given to you. And if you're atheistic, well, you might have to try to find some um, some ideas of meaning which goes beyond the supernatural and, and try to justify it in a materialistic, naturalistic world. And of course, um, personally, from my perspective, I say that is quite um, impossible to do, or at least very difficult to do, and to not fall into nihilism. I'm, I'm not sure whether Lawrence would agree with me on that, but I've, I've met a lot of people out there who, who have said they could, but I have never been very convinced about it. But, um, but what? Mm-hmm. I would say that, I mean, I agree with you personally, mm-hmm. right? But I would not throw away the fact that there are, I, I guess a significant amount of thinkers who have provided ways to live mm. uh, meaningfully in a sort of uh, world without God. But yes. mm-hmm. one of the things that people, I think, should know about Nietzsche is the idea of what does it mean to kill God? Like, killing God was not, like, a good thing, right? Um, it was a tragedy. Yeah. It was how can we atone? How, what temples can we build? The, one of the things that I've seen, actually, um, this comes from Hangeog Muller. It's, a, it's another channel called Carefree Rondering, if uh, you're interested in. Uh, I'm not sure if he's the one that says this, but I've heard it somewhere they said that um, what he's referring to there is a big what's next, right? Mm-hmm. We've killed God, right? We have uh, put him in the ground. Now, what can we do next? What are we going to replace it with? Um, and one of the big issues there is the question of how far you're satisfied with these sort of replacements. And I guess a lot of the other uh, existential thinkers are really concerned about this kind of question, right? Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is Camus, right? Like, he realizes the world is absurd and without God, like, what, what, what can we do? What can we do uh, without God? So I think I would say there are answers and people have been satisfied by those answers. But on a personal level, I agree fundamentally with you that there is no way out for the existentialists if they don't apprehend to some sort of non-naturalistic explanation of the world. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a Christian one. Um, uh, this could be... Uh, some sort of other being, um, some sort of other 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 thing that they might uh, hold to, but at the very minimum, at least the and the way that one could achieve their meaning in life, I personally would say 
yes, I, I, I would. Agree. It's a really long way, a random way of yeah. me saying that I agree with mm-hmm. you. But yeah, basically, I do agree with you. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's 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 definitely something which is worthy of thought because there is, I suppose, if you're approaching it from purely an existential or phenom- from a perspective of phenomenology, it's very easy to, I suppose, end up with a form of absurdism of Camus or or even a form of um of of well. I suppose humanism, like Sartre, I suppose yeah. could even classify him as such, and and those are potential alternatives. I suppose I think the main problem arises is when you have the metaphysical implications, and when you're thinking about the metaphysics, then I think the problems arise when you're no longer asking, can this provide meaning? Which I think a lot of times answer is yes. I mean, of course, it depends on what you qualify as meaning and what do, do you mean by does this create. But at the same time, a lot of times I think if you just if, if someone approaches Camus or someone reads Sartre, you could say, well, all right, yeah, they do provide a sufficient explanation or they do provide a, a sufficient framework, which internally may, may actually be quite consistent. I wouldn't be so harsh as to say they're completely useless. But at the same time, I do think that if you're then going to tie into metaphysics or at least tie into the further grounding behind no longer as what it does this provide meaning, but rather is this meaning or why do we have this meaning? Then I think further problems arise and further things do come out. If you've been enjoying this video so far and have found it helpful, please like and subscribe and share it with your friends. If you want to support this channel financially and support our mission, then check out our Patreon in the link below where you can support our channel there as well. Hope you enjoyed this video and let's carry on. Well, I suppose we've talked already a bit about what got us into existentialism, but well, who is existentialism for? Is I suppose someone who is walking in the street might not think analytic philosophy is exactly for them. They might not really care about philosophy of religion. They may not care about logic or whatnot. They might not care about how truth tables work in modus tollens and how you can do proofs from contradictions. But, well, existentialism, is there a similar limit as to who it is for? Or do you think it's almost a universal question that people who, by virtue of living, already experience this form of existential angst, which is, I suppose, a key existential idea or motif? amongst all thinkers? I think what, what I'd say yes, tentatively, because um, mm-hmm. we're studying analytic philosophy here in Oxford, and there's always a counterexample to be found. But I'd say yes, tentatively, because when I go back to the film, we have this saying called Bahala Na, which is like, uh, if God wills it, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that statement is one of the sort of key ideas of understanding like how existential angst has been understood by so many different cultures around the world, right? We focus a lot on our good Western friends, uh, the Beauvoir, Sartre, Kierkegaard, Heidegger. But I think this question is quite a universal question. It's something that a lot of people, whether they are in an island in the Philippines or in a city in, uh, in the West, a lot of people wonder. They 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 may get up from get up from their desk one day and think, "What am I doing? Right? What am I doing in my life? Why am I doing this?" And a lot of people can find that question very unsettling. And this is why I think existentialism like cannot be labeled a school or can be labeled a very specific like dogmatic school of thought, but it's like an approach or an attitude uh, because like. Like this question has been asked by so many people. I'm not. I don't. Maybe there is a person out there who has never asked in their life, like, "What am I doing in my life?" or "Why am I doing this?" Maybe there is that kind of person. But for at least everybody that I've met, right, they've somebody's asked this, and they've answered it in so many different interesting ways. And that's why I think existentialism is. As soon as you start ask that question, like, "What am I doing? Why? Why am I doing this?" What is my life for? What? Why? Why is my life uh, meaningful? What? What should I do in my life? As soon as you are, you've asked that, you've asked that question, you're immediately approaching something from an existential perspective, and there are so many different answers that can come out of that. I can, I I have to say I do not think I can agree with you any more on that. I think I I think I full I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I think it's a wonderful um analysis of the situation. Perhaps finally we can end off the stream by discussing my recent kind of ponderings on existentialism. I've been thinking about it recently and I was just just walking around, you know, and I was thinking a lot of times people talk about existentialism as looking for 
things which they're willing to live for. I mean, there's it's about finding meaning. And I suppose it's less so existentialism, but just meaning in general is what would I live for? Will I live for this? Will I live for that? And my more recent contribution or my most recent um, chidings and thoughts to myself has come up with the conclusion that that's the wrong way to go around doing things. But the right way to do things is to ask yourself the opposite. What things are you willing to die for? And I was just thinking about this and I was like, it, it does seem to make in initial sense in the sense of when you're thinking about life, right? You go through life, you go through, you go through your daily basis, your day, your day to day existence, you either at work or at whatnot. What you're willing to live for changes frequently, I would say. I mean, I want to live for, I want to make some money or I want to get some or, or what, whatever it is, right? But then when you're thinking about what you're willing to die for, it seems to be something which is more fundamental, even though it seems to be worshipping or at least focusing on the end of existence instead of the beginning of existence, which is life and the end of existence being death. There still seems to be almost that a lot of our questions, a lot of our our existential thoughts are tied to the idea of the finitude, tied to the death. So thinking about what we're willing to die for is almost just as important or if not even more significant and more telling than what we're willing to live for. I was wondering your thoughts on this or whether you agree or disagree or, or whatnot. I completely agree actually with that. Like this is, I was thinking about what you were about to say and the, immediately th the immediate thought I had is, what are you going to die for? I think I, I fully agree that like, this, is, this is something that we should investigate more because I mean, people are willing to, as I mean, a lot of the new atheists from, from 2006 uh, often were admonishing religion, like saying, how could anyone die for this? You know what religion makes? 9-11, they make the 7-7 seven, seven bombings, right? Mm. And a lot of these people are trying to question, like, what is, what does it to die for? Why should we die for it? And uh, disregarding terrorism for a second, but just in general, like a lot of people go through their lives and they almost don't even think about this question at all because the idea of death is so uncomfortable and disconcerting. Um, I, there are people who I've seen and I've known are, who are very uncomfortable with the idea of not existing. And once you find a reason that you can... Uh, die for basically uh, i'm thinking of almost nietzsche's like um once you figured out the why you can suffer almost any how right mm. and this why i don't think he may be he, i think in his wider thought he probably is thinking of that massive yes to life the mm. eternal recurrence um i would be very happy if the demon was to come to me and say that i could live this life uh um, in, an infinite amount of times but i think an even more deeper sense to even move from Nietzsche is that um, why the answer to the why should be more uh, should I die for this is this something worth dying for and there are times when uh, a lot of people have like seen um, the growth of Christianity as being sort of centered around this question uh, I believe it's Tertullian who said that uh, Christianity is built upon the blood of the martyrs and the impression of the martyrs, the impression of the people that died for this very fledgling religion. This it, it's, it's not a popular one. It's not something that you can just go into and see, oh, this is an easy thing to do, right? It's a difficult religion to hold. It's, and it's, it's uh, something, especially the ancient world, would be, would be persecuted for. But these people still were willing to die for it. And I think I don't know necessarily the answers to that question. Mm. I don't think I, I don't I don't, know, I don't think either of us do. Uh, maybe maybe have some sort of uh, preliminary thoughts on on how to answer that. But I think that there's definitely something to analyze in much further detail. That I think uh, some people, at least, maybe haven't read it. We have we, we haven't seen yet. But some people haven't addressed it fully enough yet. Mm. I definitely agree with that, and I think finding what you're willing to die for is something which comes along once in a blue moon. I, I don't think people go through life and are like, okay, I'll die for this, that, that, yeah, that, exactly. that, and give you a list of like 10 or 12 things. And I think that's the true significance or the true indicator of something which means a lot to you. It's the indication that something is important to you because it means the end. Like, will you be able to give up everything for that one thing? 
And I think that's the important idea. That's the important motif. That's the important spirit to ask yourself is what is that in the world which we would value more than life itself? And it doesn't come around a lot, I would say, and it doesn't yeah. come around easily. But I think when you're trying to pursue it, when you're trying to figure out what means that much to you, and of course, it's a subjective decision. I don't think I would ever be able to come out with one idea and say, that is the one thing that everyone should be willing to die for. I don't think that's the case. But at the same time, it is something that when you truly come across it, only you will know and only you will be able to justify what it is and what it means to you. And I think that is the significance of what are you willing to die for? And, and that is how it keeps us going and keeps us thinking. And when you do find that purpose, then, well, I think it'll be wonderful. I think there is that <laughs> peace which comes to it when you're saying, well, I am so perfectly in love with that one thing or so perfectly at peace or have so much admiration for that one thing, which you you're able to do everything for it. And I think that's a very beautiful sentiment or state of being to be in. Mm. And of course it could bring great sadness, but at the same time it brings great peace. And I think it's the constant wrestling between those two motives or those two ideas, which, which makes all the difference, I suppose. Is there anything else you want to add? I want to ask a question. Do you think mm. there are people who will never, what do you think about people who may never find this kind of answer of what it is to die for? Do you think such people, well, do you think that, that because it's such a rare event, do you think this actually happens to everybody? Or do you think this, this is uh, something for a few people who have thought about it? I think it's something that everyone has the chance to experience. Mm. And I'll word it like that, just because I would say not everyone will experience it, but I think everyone can experience it if they're willing to open up their hearts to a certain degree yeah. of of love and of and of affiliation and affinity to certain people or certain ideas. I think if that is the case, then I think everyone will be able to experience it. I mean, what comes to mind the most is is just the analogy of of a mother who's willing to do anything to protect their child. Yeah. They're willing to uh, run into a burning building or or whatnot. And and I think that idea is 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 similar to the idea of finding something you're willing to die for. It's that idea, that idea of childbirth, the idea of um having a being which which you love so much for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that we all may be able to save is that that thing is that which is willing to die for, you know, it's, it's that idea that we can open ourselves up to it. We can reach out to it, but at the same time, it might not come to all of us equally. And, and it depends on how we're willing to open our, our hearts. And, and maybe it's, it might not be good for some people to open up their hearts. Maybe it will bring them more pain than it brings them joy. Maybe it'll bring them more suffering than, than anything else. But at the same time, I think it really depends on that state of yourself being open to open to the potential of you finding that love. Because I think once you find it, it's impossible to get it out of you. It's, it's impossible to fight against it. And mm. it's something which is so powerful that that when you are in face of it, there's nothing more you can do than just say, well, I'm here. Um, the Lord is good that he's given it to me. And if this is a cross I must carry, then that it's a cross I must carry, you know. And, mm. and I suppose it ends off with the, Sisyphean, Id Sisyphean idea where it's something like I imagine Sisyphus happy even though he's pushing up that rock every day up the hill and I suppose yeah. it's not exactly the same but that sentiment that mode of existence that feeling I think is is, is similar and I, I'll say that's perhaps the answer or the idea to your to yeah. that question yeah that was that was very well worded that was very well worded well I think with that I think we can end off our first stream on our discussion on existentialism. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. If you'd like to support our channel financially as well, then go check out Patreon. You can go find that out in the link below as well. Stay safe, my friends. See you soon. Thank you for watching. God bless. And I'll see you in the next video. See you soon and goodbye.